and I am the Newcomer Connections Coordinator for Mennonite Central Committee U.S. MCC is a worldwide, sorry, is a worldwide ministry of Anabaptist, of, is a worldwide ministry of Anabaptist churches that shares God's love and compassion for all in the name of Christ by responding to basic human needs and working for peace and justice. One of our three areas of focus is to increase the capacity of our partners to help uprooted and displaced peoples throughout the world, including the United States. MCC in the US helps to educate about immigration issues, advocates for sensible and humane immigration laws, works to build peace in communities along the US-Mexico border, and provides documentation services to help immigrants navigate the complex immigration system. Before we jump in, I wanted to go over some quick housekeeping information. This will be an hour long webinar and we are recording this webinar. So we will share the recording on our website and with everyone who is registered for this webinar. We'll be opening the webinar with introductions, scripture and prayer. And then we'll be hearing from Ted Blessing, who is a community engagement organizer at Church World Service. Ted will be sharing about how refugee resettlement works in the United States. After our TED Talk, there will be a time for questions. You can type your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, and we will do our best to answer as many questions as possible. I will also share my email so you, we can connect afterwards as well. I recently joined MCC as the Newcomer Connections Coordinator, so I thought I'd very quickly introduce myself. I live in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania with my husband and two cats. Harrisburg is home to thousands of refugees who have settled here over the past 40 years. Before coming to MCC, I worked for 10 years with refugees, asylum seekers, and immigrants as a refugee resettlement caseworker, adult English teacher, and volunteer coordinator. Through that work, I've been able to become friends with many former refugees and immigrants from many different backgrounds. I wanted to introduce you to one of my friends. This is Vlad. In this picture, uh, Vlad is uh, using Google Translate on his phone to tell my husband and I about the different adventures he's had in his very colorful life. Vlad came to the United States as a refugee from Ukraine in 2016. And since his arrival, I've gotten to know him as his teacher and now as simply his friend. Like so many refugees resettled in the United States, Vlad struggles to communicate in English. He struggles with the vulnerability he experiences when trying to navigate complicated and confusing American bureaucratic systems. The pain of feeling out of place is real, and he often remembers the sadness he feels um, on a daily basis, uh, having about his home and the community he's for he was forced to leave. Yet like so many former refugees, Vlad's displacement does not define him, and Vlad persists. He cultivates a garden behind his apartment building. He makes jokes in English class and studies to pass his citizenship test. He even runs barefoot in the morning uh, to stay in shape. He has created a life for himself despite the conditions that forced him to leave his country. During this webinar, as we learn about how refugees come to the United States and find home in different communities, my prayer is that we will come away with a desire to be intentional about welcoming people like Vlad, who come from all different nations and who have so much to share with us. What MCC is hearing from our partners who serve displaced peoples throughout the United States is that help is very much needed as more families seek refuge in the United States. My role as the Newcomer Connections Coordinator is to walk alongside congregations and individuals as you explore what welcoming newcomers means in your particular context, uh, whether that be through volunteering, co-sponsoring, resource sharing, partnering, or other ways that make sense in your community to um, accompany families in your welcoming work. We know that many in our Anabaptist community are already serving newcomers, and we want to help you connect with each other to encourage one another and to share best practices. So if you or your congregation are interested in welcoming newcomers um, or are already engaged in welcoming work, I'd love to hear from you to see how we can provide resources and support. Uh, 
As you can see, my email is very simple. It's just a welcome at mcc.org. Um, we also have a website, uh, which I will put in the chat later, which is uh, just www.mcc.org slash community sponsorship. Um, so before we jump into Ted's presentation, I think it's really important that we um, remember what motivates our work. So as Christians, we are called to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the sick and those in prison and welcome the stranger. The need and call is greater than anything we could ever meet individually. But one thing I've continuously learned again and again is that regardless of the situation, we are called to put our hope in God, not in ourselves or our institutions. So with that, uh, let's read some scripture and pray and then I'll hand it over to Ted. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God who is gracious for he is gracious and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. He casts the wicked to the ground. Dear Jesus, our journey through life is long and hard. We cannot make this trip alone. We must walk together on the journey. You promised to send us a helper, your spirit. Help us to see your spirit and those you send to journey with us. In the refugee family, seeking safety from violence, let us see your spirit. In the migrant worker, bringing food to, to our tables, let us see your spirit. In the asylum seeker, seeking justice for himself and his family, let us see your spirit. In the unaccompanied child, traveling in a dangerous world, let us see your spirit. Teach us to recognize that as we walk with each other, you are present. Teach us to welcome not only the strangers in our midst, but the gifts they bring as well. The invitation to conversion, communion, and solidarity. This is the help you have sent. We are not alone. We are together on the journey. And for this, we give you thanks. Amen. Thank you. Uh, so now I'm going to hand it over to Ted. Thank you. Great. Thank you all. Let me share my screen super quick here. All righty. So you should be able to see my screen. Oh, it's blue now instead of white. No problem. We will make it work. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Ted Blessing. I am the Community Engagement Organizer for Church World Service. Um, as, as Charity was speaking, I realized, man, my name sounds like a full-on stage name, so I apologize for, I mean, I don't apologize. I didn't give it to myself, um, but the Ted talk and with Blessing, that is my official name. Um, prior to working at Church World Service, and I've only been in my role here at Church World Service for about a half a year, uh, but prior to working at Church World Service, I spent many years working um, at the local level working in, in Lincoln, Nebraska. I am calling in today from a uh, windy and tornado-y Lincoln, Nebraska, um, where I worked at the local affiliate level, an affiliate of Church World Service to help um, with exactly this work, with, with community engagement and refugee resettlement. So my role in that, um, and that space really prepared me for what I am doing now. Um, and and this, this presentation is, is in line with everything that I've been doing for the last five years. So I am really, really excited to speak with you all today um, on what refugee resettlement looks like in the United States, where we've been, uh, where we're at right now, where we're going, and then how, how you all um, as, as, community, uh, as community can help engage in this space. As a reminder, please throw any questions that you might have into the question and answer section. Um, try to do so in there because I do have that question and answer section pulled up so I can uh, kind of in live time take a look at those questions and answer them if we're in that, in that uh, on that train of thought. 
um, and try not to put them in the chat as I cannot see the chat right now, although I was uh, enjoying seeing some folks and seeing where everyone is at. But today, the plan for today's presentation is to walk you through um, what refugee resettlement looks like from literally square one. We are actually going to start with the definition of a refugee, what their plight looks like, and then what, it, and then what their systems look like here in the United States uh, once they are resettled. So what is a refugee? We will start with the definition of a refugee, which we derive from the 1951 Refugee Convention by the UNHCR. That is the United Nations High Commissioner of Refugee. Now you'll see there is a definition there, and I want to point out some very key points to, to this definition that will help differentiate a refugee from other immigration statuses. So a refugee is someone who is unable or unwilling to return to their country of origin, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for a multitude of reasons. These reasons can include things like race, nationality, membership of a social group, political opinion, um, and frequently religion as well. Now, I mentioned this as not all immigrants fit this definition, thus that is why not everyone becomes a refugee. I will use the example of um, an Iraqi family of four to help illustrate what this process looks like. So in Iraq, there is a, um, an ethnic and religious minority called the Yazidi people. You might have heard of them. That's Y-A-Z-I-D-I. -I. Um, the Yazidi people were heavily, heavily targeted by ISIS in Iraq. Um, that was on the basis of their religion and even uh, in this case, maybe also the, the membership of a particular social group as they were considered an ethnic minority. So because of their persecution from ISIS, many of the Yazidi people in Iraq had to flee Iraq um, or flee their towns, their hometowns, their homes, um, and make it to a refugee camp. At this point, when, when at a refugee camp, that is when that family or individual would go through the process of proving their persecution for one of these reasons. So in our example of the Iraqi family of four, they would go to the camp and prove their persecution um, based on reasons of religion. And for that reason, that family of four would receive their refugee status. Now, once they receive that refugee status and eventually travel to the United States, Germany, wherever else they might be resettled, they are fully documented. So their documentation and their processing happens all um, abroad at a refugee camp. And this is in, in uh, I would say a typical world, right? Um, we're seeing some, some new things as of late, but typically all this is happening abroad. Um, and then by the time that, that that family or individual arrives to the United States or wherever, um, they are fully documented. This may differ maybe from a family of four who is um, crossing our southern border from Mexico and fleeing drug cartel violence. That family of four might not be able to prove or, or to receive refugee status and that they cannot prove their well-founded fear of persecution based on one of these reasons. Instead, they might uh, be indiscriminately targeted by drug cartel violence, and for that reason, they, they, will, they would not receive their refugee status. So just wanted to illustrate um, how refugees get here and, and under what reasoning. It is, for a, it, it is under this very, very specific definition um, that individuals receive refugee status. And the refugee program is not that old. Um, it was founded in 1980. Um, and since World War II, we have, we have all been actively resettling refugees across the country for a multitude of reasons and from many uh, regions. Now, each year, the president of the US sets the admission ceiling for refugees um, at the start of our fiscal year. So our fiscal year runs, in, um, runs starting in September. So in September, we're, we're always really looking to see what's the ceiling going to be. Um, there is a report that is provided to Congress from the president, but this is quite literally a presidential determination. The person in office makes this decision that sets the ceiling for refugee admissions for the entire year. Now, in this report, it, um, the president will also outline which regions of the world we expect to see refugees come from and under what circumstances. So um, that it really does help meet the need of whatever um, uh, displaced peoples we are seeing at the current time. And this happens every single year. And I'll touch base on what these numbers look like in just a second. And here are where folks are going. So I apologize that the writing is incredibly, incredibly small. Um, a couple things to note on this map. In the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see um, all of the, the national headquarter agencies of which resettle refugees. So these are the, the headquarter agencies like Church World Service, which I represent, um, who receive refugee statuses and then disperse them across their affiliate network in the United States, of which you can see here. 
So there are multiple affiliates in places like San Diego. There's a couple here in my hometown of Lincoln, um, quite a few on the East Coast. And this gives you a general idea of where folks are being resettled. Now do note that these are not all Church World Service affiliates. Um, th this is a uh, conglomerate of all of the, the national resettlement agencies. So if you are looking to engage in this refugee resettlement space after this presentation, which I really hope you do, um, do know that the closest office to you might not be a Church World Service representative. It might be um, an LIRS, Lutheran Immigration Refugee Services representative, for instance. Um, so for that reason, uh, we, we uh, don't take whatever, or don't believe that you can only work, work with Church World Service. We would be happy to refer you out to the other uh, resettlement agencies as well. But here are the offices that Church World Service um, oversees. Church World Service has resettled over 865 thousand newcomers since its inception, um, a pretty impressive number there. Um, and, we re and we resettle thousands of individuals per year across our network. Now again, this is not conclusive of all of the locations of which are resettling refugees, um, but, but illustrates where, um, where our services touch. And we're always adding new offices. In about six months, I guarantee you, we'll have some more offices on this list. So let's, uh, in and kind of circling back to uh, our, our example of a family of four from Iraq, I see a question, how is it decided which camp a person or family will go to? Fantastic question. Um, oftentimes, it's the, it's the nearest camp in which a family can get to in whatever way possible. So for that reason, uh, a, a good example might be there are, multi, there are a multitude of refugee camps in Iraq itself. So, so individuals might flee Iraq and make it to a refugee camp in Iraq. Those are um, essentially these safe havens for individuals that are refugees to be processed um, and moved from there. Once the, um, at one point, and this, this was a few years ago, the average number of time or, or the average number of years that a family of four spent in a refugee camp in the Middle East was 16 years. In fact, when I worked at the local level here in Lincoln, Nebraska, it was not uncommon for us to resettle a refugee family. And, and in that family were teenagers who had known nothing outside of a refugee camp. They were born in a refugee camp, they were raised there, and they came to the United States. That, that leads to a whole new um, level of integration needed for those individuals, right? Not only um, do, are they in a new country, they have no formal conception of what community is, right? They, they, are, only think, um, they, they are only considered um, home in a, in a refugee camp. So just wanted to illustrate just the, the amount of time that families can spend in these refugee camps. Oftentimes that is due to things um, like processing, background checks, interviews, medical appointments. All these must, um, must be done before a family receives that refugee status and then can travel to the United States. Um, and I do see a question if, if, if we can share the map. I'm going to share all these slides at the end of this presentation so you can look at all of them. We have links embedded that you can click and, and do some more research in too. So um, do keep an eye out for that after this presentation. So how do folks get to the United States? The family of four in Iraq that makes it to a refugee camp. They spend their time in the camp and they're processed. How do they then end up in the United States under Church World Service in one of these locations or, um, or in, uh, or in, any location in the map previously. We operate under a great program called the US TIE program. So a US TIE is um, someone that clients abroad in a refugee camp will identify stateside um, that serves as their tie to that location. You can think of family members, mom, dad, uh, siblings, cousins, aunts, even friends can serve as US TIEs. That is under the assumption that if we tie that case to that individual in the United States, there's already some built-in support network and mechanism for that family when they arrive. Now, not all cases that we resettle are U.S. Thai cases. In fact, quite a few cases, especially nowadays, are non-U.S. Thai cases or free cases, F-R-E-E. -E. Now, these cases um, are essentially allocated to whichever location in the United States has the capacity to take them, and they do require a little bit more hands-on um, uh, work. And they require some community engagement and that they do not have that built-in support network that maybe a US Thai case would have. But for the most part, we are seeing cases travel to the United States with US ties. Those US ties vary in level of commitment to the family. Some are willing to help out um, in any way they possibly can, and others are busy with their own lives and cannot. That is what our case management is for here in the United States. So I um, just wanted to illustrate how folks are getting here. 
Um, prior to this, our case workers across the United States have no contact with clients abroad. In fact, the first time that case workers hear of a client um, is about on average three weeks prior to that family's arrival. So what happens when the family arrives? We get a notice of three weeks at the local level. What happens then? We operate under the Reception and Placement Program, the RMP program that serves refugees from the exact minute that they arrive in the United States at the airport. Now, this is a 90-day program um, with the aim to integrate refugees into their local community and to ensure that they are self-sufficient upon the end of their 90-day program. Now, at 90 days, we must federally close their case. So if, if, if we weren't living in post-COVID times and we were all in person, I would, I would typically ask you to raise your hand if you believe you could be dropped in Syria and in three months be considered self-sufficient and no hands go in the air, right? Um, this is also true for refugees who come to the United States. So I really wanted to also um, to illustrate that this is not the only program that, that manages refugees in the United States. Once the, the 90 days are up and the, and the case is federally closed, there are a multitude of other programs of which we can enroll clients in to help them with ongoing services. Think um, state employment services, um, intensive case management, that sort of thing. But for the most part, it is the federal government's understanding that in 90 days, um, a case will be self-sufficient. And in those 90 days, a lot has to happen. Things like the airport pickup, um, housing. So we must find um, and secure safe and affordable housing even before the family arrives to the United States. Now, nowadays, this has become more difficult. Affordable housing is in, uh, is in high demand and short supply. So we oftentimes see, see cases go to Airbnbs or hotels until we can locate housing. But I, did, I just wanted to illustrate how difficult this process can be in resettlement from even prior to day one. Even before the family arrives, we must secure housing and we must find landlords who are willing to rent to us when we don't have the clients physically here yet, have no proof of income and no credit score. So luckily, um, our caseworkers across the affiliate network work really, really hard to uh, foster good relationships with landlords that trust them, that they will be able to meet the rent um, requirement once the, once the clients come. And once they do, that house must be fully furnished, must, be, uh, must have all items that are required to be in a home. Think the brooms, the, the mops, the dishes, the towel sheets, all of that must be in the apartment ready to go so that the second the family arrives at the airport, um, the, the caseworkers or community members can bring them directly home and their, and their home is ready for them. From there, we are working on cultural orientation, which you can consider sort of United States 101. Um, things like banking, that the um, home ownership, laws in the United States, all things that newcomers would need to know um, in entering the United States. School enrollments for children, employment assistance for any employable adult, transportation, which um, can be an issue depending on where you are located. And oftentimes we turn to community members to help in this space. Um, as, as many locations do not have a, a readily available mass transport system. And then things like public benefits and assistance with healthcare. All of this must happen within the 90 days. And then that, uh, then that client or family is considered self-sufficient and their case is closed. So what do the numbers look like? Who's coming, how many? Here is a great, great, great graph that shows the, the annual ceiling that is set by the president each year, that's in blue. And then the orange line is the number of actual admitted refugees per year to the United States. Now this is across the United States. And I'll draw your attention to a couple of points here. The first really interesting point I find is in 2001, right after 9-11, uh, you can see refugee admissions plummeted. That was in response to uh, public sentiment for refugees post 9-11. And then more recently, you can see that um, the ceiling has really ebbed and flowed based on the, on the crises in the world and what, and what uh, displaced peoples there were and what the need was. So in 2016, sort of the height of the Syrian crisis, you can see that we increased the refugee admissions to about 85,000. And then under the previous presidential administration, you will note that we were hitting some historic lows in terms of refugee resettlement, uh, as low as 18,000 individuals per year. Now, a lot of folks will ask me, um, even at historic lows there, I see that you didn't necessarily hit that ceiling. The number of admitted refugees was still lower. That was, uh, in, that, well, that was due to a multitude of factors, things like um, the Muslim travel ban. The Muslim travel ban took a, um, took a hit on some of the folks who were able to actually travel in resettlement. 
COVID took a big hit on our numbers and who and who was able to be processed um, during, especially during those first um, that first year of COVID. And then also things like staffing abroad have really impacted our numbers over time. United States Citizenship and Immigration Services offices abroad, USCIS offices, um, have been drastically cut over time, which has really slowed down the processing for, for, uh, for new refugees. All of this to illustrate where we are at with our numbers and why we don't necessarily always hit the ceiling. Now, another thing I want to draw your attention to, we've all heard about the Ukraine conflict, um, the war in Ukraine, and that the United States, I, I expect many of you have heard that the United States has pledged to resettle 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. And that is on top of our regular refugee admissions from displaced people across the country in addition. Now, while we don't know what this will look like in practice, it's still very fluid. We're still learning new things every minute. What I can tell you is that we are looking at going from a period of time, especially at the end of 2020, of extreme lows in terms of our um, admitted refugees to extreme highs. Why does this matter? Our funding for case management and refugee resettlement is directly tied to how many individuals travel. So the more refugees that come, the more case workers that can be hired and the capacity grows. Over time, as, as fewer arrivals come through our pipeline, case management is cut, um, and, and we have fewer folks who are, who are able to service refugees. But now we are looking at a time of going from extreme lows to extreme highs. I mentioned this to say, while we are ramping up, and we actually have been doing so very rapidly in response to the Afghan Placement and Assistance Program, um, we still need help from the community. We are going from a time of extreme lows to extreme highs. This is where the community really comes in and helps us out. So I did just want to mention that very briefly. Um, that we, are, that we are expecting a time of extreme lows to extreme highs. So who is coming? What, what's the makeup? Um, you, you can see here what the, uh, what the admissions have looked like uh, in 2021 and how they've compared to, um, and, and, and how they've compared over time. Uh, we're seeing a, a drastic drop in a lot of the populations that we've resettled over time. Um, but you can see that uh, in 2021, the top five uh, nationalities were from the Congo, Syria, Afghanistan, Ukraine, and Burma. So what that tells me, especially in regards to the Ukraine uh, number there, being at 803, is that there are some Ukrainians already stateside that can serve as U.S. ties for the folks who are abroad. Um, I think a very interesting point there. Again, I will send all of these slides out um, at the end for further review. Just in the interest of time, I'm going to push through a little fast. Here are the refugee admissions of, two, of 2022. So here are the refugees that we have seen resettled to date and where they are coming from. Uh, we have been approved to resettle 65,000 refugees across the United States. Now that's across all of the resettlement agencies, not just Church World Services, um, Church World Service. Um, and, that, and that is in addition to 10,000 SIVs, special immigrant visa holders. Um, who will also travel. Now, just a really quick aside, special immigrant visa holders are those typically from Iraq and Afghanistan who served the U.S. military abroad, and in doing so will receive the special immigrant visa to travel um, similarly to, to refugees. Now, we will not hit this number. Um, we will not hit the ceiling again, um, and that is uh, in, in part due to the COVID pandemic um, and also due to staffing and having to ramp up over time. We also had um, a, a small crisis in Afghanistan that we had to deal with that, um, that really changed our numbers over time as well. Again, I'll send out these slides with this information. So what happened in Afghanistan? Where, so this is where we've been at, you know, a large picture. Let's zoom in to, to more recently. Um, as, you, as many of you may know, we have been resettling Afghans in the United States since September when the Afghan Placement and Assistant Program launched. And we have been working with, with Afghans ever since. Now, up until about February 19th, there, was, there were over actually 70,000 Afghans resettled across the United States. And we are still resettling Afghans to this day. Um, in fact, that's a big part of my role is making sure that the second wave of Afghans, the first wave that came um, when we all saw it on the news by flight and were stationed across US military bases, all those bases have been cleared and closed. There is now one national conference center in Virginia that is now picking up the remainder of folks who are abroad, of Afghans who are abroad and in danger. They are now traveling to this uh, national conference center and are, being, um, and are being resettled from there. You can think of these bases in this national conference center as sort of quasi refugee camps and that this is where these folks are being processed as refugees prior to traveling to their final destination. 
I mentioned this to say that if you are looking to engage in the space of welcome, there will be many opportunities with the, with the Ukraine crisis in the future, but even currently right now in this moment, we are, we are, we are managing this phase two of Afghan um, placement arrivals. So um, if you are looking to engage in this space, this is somewhere, or this is, um, this is a need that could, could absolutely be filled. And here are predominantly where Afghans are being resettled. Now, this is, uh, this is not conclusive of where Afghans are, right? I'm in Lincoln, Nebraska here, right in the heartland of the country, and we still have Afghans coming here as well. But for the most part, we're seeing Afghans uh, resettled in Texas, California, and Virginia. The Virginia numbers are increasing rapidly. So if you're in the Virginia area, chances are there is going to be a need for a resettlement in the area. Um, but but, but do note that these are the, the primary hubs of Afghans and where the need is the greatest right now. And similar to the reception and placement program, the Afghan assistance placement and the Afghan placement and assistance program is very similar in that there is a 90 day service period, a similar list of core services that must be completed, including that airport reception, finding housing, all the enrollments, cultural orientation. You'll notice a lot of the similar, um, a lot of similar uh, phrases there. These are all the items that must be completed upon arrival to the United States. So we're operating under the reception and placement program and the Afghan placement and assistance program, but both of which are very, very similar. So how can you all get involved, right? We know where they're coming um, from, how they are getting here, where they are at. What can you all do as community members to engage in this space and in this space of welcome? We we use community sponsorship to, to, to define our community engagement strategy. And this is sort of an, an, an umbrella term to, to describe our co-sponsorship support teams and private sponsorship. Now today I'm really going to focus on co-sponsorship and support teams as private sponsorship is a little more nuanced. Um, although if you have more questions, please let me know and I'd be happy to answer them. But for the most part, we see community groups um, and leaders in community like yourselves engage in co-sponsorship with, with our refugee populations. So co-sponsorship is defined as the, um, as the service delivery of at least half of services that PRM um, has allowed to delegate. What does all of that mean? So PRM is the population of refugees and migrants. They are, they are our bosses essentially, and they are the ones who, who create the rules for refugee resettlement. Now they have identified 14 services in, the, in that 90 day window um, that can be delegated from the resettlement agency at the local level to community groups and co-sponsor groups. Now to be considered a co-sponsor group, you must meet at least half of these services or more than half. So that means you, you must complete at least eight of these 14 services. Now these services do vary depending on um, the office that you are working with. Some offices will have item, will, um, will ask community members to engage with things such as furnishing the home prior to the family's arrival, maybe transportation to medical appointments, maybe help with applying for benefits or applying to a job, right? Each office will, will, will determine what these, some of these services are and then the community group can determine what they would like to engage in with that family. Now, the community group will accept um, in a non-legally binding agreement uh, that they will provide all of these services to the resettlement agency um, in whatever capacity they are able to. Oftentimes, most groups that, that, that we have worked with, at least at the local level, have done things like furnishing the home, um, welcoming the family at the airport, which is such a such a lovely experience, helping them with their integration, maybe serving as a mentor, helping them with their English. Um, these are all things that must be completed in, um, by the resettlement agency that they'll help delegate to community groups and leaders like yourselves. Now, for the APA clients, the the um, our Afghan clients, there are twenty tasks that can be delegated out to co-sponsor groups, so they must meet eleven uh, to to be considered a co-sponsor. Now, if you cannot meet all of those, um, that threshold, um, you are considered a support team. You might have also heard of them as welcome teams. This is another, um, if you are maybe hearing this and going, whoa, I don't know if I am quite ready to fully take on all those responsibilities required in resettlement, no worries, start small. I would really recommend if you are new to this space, start small. Maybe commit to furnishing the apartment and some mentorship. Maybe, maybe you have a group of 20 who are willing to move in all the furniture to the apartment, but two of you are interested in working with the family longer term, commit to a smaller amount of services and engage in that space. Because any amount of service that is provided from the community is, um, is uh, an incredible asset to the family. 
I will tell you just purely anecdotally, the cases that, that I had worked with that had community engagement um, and, and community sponsorship experience, um, and the ones that did not were, 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 um, were integrated in a far different way. Those that had the community groups and members um, working with them, helping them integrate, were able to do so far easily than those without. So, so do know that even if you start small, there's a large, large impact to the work you are doing. Even if that is furnishing the apartment and maybe going over to the family's home once every other week to help with English. Now, what the activities are will vary based on the location of which uh, uh, you are closest to and the affiliate of which you are closest to. But nonetheless, that connection to someone in the community um, is invaluable for clients. And we've seen that be such, a, um, um, such an important piece to their integration. What I wanted to do very quickly is share a video with you all. And while I do so, I will, I will read through these questions um, and, and start to answer some of them. This is a, about a 10 minute video, which seems long, I know, um, but I think it really, really well uh, illustrates what this looks like in terms of community sponsorship, how, um, how community sponsorship works and what it looks like in practice. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second and then reshare uh, with, with this video. And if you have any issues um, hearing it, please let me know. Um, and I will, oh, let me actually make sure I have the right sound. Perfect. All right. Very quickly, we will watch this and then we'll jump back in with some questions. Please feel free to, as you watch this, to throw any questions in the chat if you would like, um, or into the Q&A if you would like, and we'll, and, we'll, and we'll be sure to answer those at the end. <laughs> Welcoming refugees brings Americans together. These are people from all walks of life. People from different political parties, people from different faiths, different ages, and they all come together to welcome a refugee family. We're a group of volunteers. We have about a dozen different faith-based or secular groups that are involved. Is that straight now, or would you, do I have to hold it a little Most of us worked together two years ago to settle a Syrian family in Stamford. Now we're really pleased that we're going to be welcoming this Afghan family. Eventually we'll have to teach them about recycling, but not yet. There's so much for them to understand. We have to prioritize. We are working together in this collaborative way, you know, to help this family start a new life. It just makes my heart feel good to be part of something important. This is very important. I was one of the many people who was really moved uh, by the picture of that little boy's body uh, washing up on the beach, the little three-year-old. And it just seemed uh, that the problem was too big to solve, but it did seem that there should be some small step that we could take locally. We're making the bed with Diana. Yeah. Yeah. Diana, we're waiting for you, honey. Refugees need friends more than they need anything else. The key thing is to help them become self-sufficient as quickly as possible and to integrate. Remember when you were first, when we were still using Google Translate, yeah. trying to, yeah, yeah. and how bad that was? Yeah. But one of the things, when you were sitting at the table and you were trying to explain what you wanted, and it came up, master of my destiny. Do you remember that? Yes. yes. You wanted to be able to chart your course. I'm coming, zero. Everything, language, work, I, I can't. For nothing, nothing. Look, after two years. Yep. Wow. Here you are. I drive, my son drive, children go to school, I have work, mm -hmm. my wife, I have home. I have nice friends. <laughs> Relationships, I mean, this is what makes things good. 
So our first shopping trip, we're going around, and, and you're going around with, 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 okay, what are we looking? And we looked at, we brought up onions, we looked at parsnips, we looked at turnip, and so we're going around, no idea, and finally we're like halfway through the stores, and he comes up with champignon, you know, champignon. Champignon. Like, oh, mushrooms! And we got it through. Oh, oh my goodness. Okay, and here we are. Cheers. Yes. Yeah. I can't get any better. Yeah. I don't know what we expected from this, but we just wanted to help. A group of us play a lot of board games. We wanted to help and do something, so we decided to actually do stuff. Today I came here to help uh, sort out their health coverage and find a provider that is closer to where they live. It's hard enough to navigate this as an English speaker and a native here, like, let alone trying to figure it out when it's never written in the language that you understand. We're all very attached to them. It also helps us as a group of friends, like we always see each other once a week for sure, because we're going to meet up and then hang out with the family and enjoy each other's company. I love what we do. <laughs> I love that we're able to help, and I think we've all formed relationships with everyone in, the, in this family, because that's the best that we can do, I suppose. I want people in my life that inspire me, and I want to go for it. I don't want to sit back and wait, you know? But anyway. That's my hair look. <laughs> this afternoon will be, uh, this little excursion will be valuable because the family gets to be around live musicians. They get to see instruments from the Ozarks. This is a real cultural oh, Ozark experience. Mr. Bones. Oh, Mr. Bones. They've been here for three months. So they get to see more about their land that they have moved to. Oh, welcome. Hey, I'm making some hot cocoa. <laughs> Joseph, you want some hot cocoa? Yeah. Did you make a snowball? Did you? You made a snowman? Snowball. 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 You threw it at her. We'll have to have a little snowball. <laughs> It's made me grow in ways of just knowing that, that in my own little teeny way, it makes a difference. And that I can still make a difference. And it's inspired me to do more of that in some ways. And it gives me a peace of mind that I am doing something. Crying as you live? Yeah, no, I just came. I just came back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, came back from to here. Mm -hmm. When most people hear Arkansas, I think the last thing that comes to mind is refugee resettlement. This community really rallies around these refugees, and we welcome them. Hello. They're not refugees anymore. They're they're. Arkansans, community yeah. Community members. They are, yeah, they are our community members, and uh, they contribute just as much as any community member here. Yeah. And I think our community is stronger because of refugees in our area. When I went to Afghanistan, I didn't expect to have the experience that I had. After I met the children there, it, it changed my life forever. And, um, sorry. Um, you know, we know what's going on in Syria right now. And some of them may never come because they may not survive another day. You did uh, an amazing job. You are changing a lot of lives. We are coming to see my sister. She's having a play about her life story, like how she was, she was in Syria, she moved to Turkey. Here we go. Here we go, yes. My name is Zarin Hamo, and I'm 20 years old. 
I am a Kurdish refugee from the city of Aleppo in Syria. The war in Syria started eight years ago. My father said we would be safer in Turkey, and we fled across the border. For three years, I worked 18 hours a day in a factory making clothes. I could not go to school. And then after that, the United States allowed now my family, and then they. When you are like in Turkey, you hope for good people. But when we got here, we were shocked. They're the best. Like, they, they treated us like their family. They made us feel that we are one of them. They were like really, really helpful. My, my goal is to contribute to this community after going to college because it's, it's really tremendous help they gave us. So we got to give back to them. I'm going to be nurse or doctor because I love a lot of children and the old people. We don't have a monopoly on, you know, compassionate, open-minded hospitality toward refugees. What's happening here, it exists all across the country. If people just learn more about it, met refugees, participated in these programs, there'd be so much more support. Oh my God. It's a selfish thing, but I, I want to feel like I'm still contributing to this planet because I am in this time in my life. You think we're helping you? No, it's for us because <laughs> we have so much joy in knowing you. I think it's definitely changed all of us too. And be more mindful about the choices that we make. I've made sisters, I've made brothers, they've invited me into their house. They're, they're family, they're family to me. You know, you, you try to make a difference in someone's life. And then on a personal level, it's just been a lot of fun meeting these new people that I would have never met if we weren't working together on this project. That's my story, love, 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 love. This is the most exciting, satisfying work I've done. Thank you for saving my dream. It's just, I don't know what I'm gonna say. It's just thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna stop for thank you. All right. I hope you enjoyed that. I think it's, I, I can speak on resettlement all day long, um, but I think some of the best information comes when you hear it in practice. Each story is different. Each, um, each experience is different and is lovely in its own way. Um, these are human beings that we're dealing with at the end of the day. Um, they, they might come with their complications, but at the end of the day, it's, it's such a beautiful, beautiful experience. So um, really wanted to, wanted to illustrate that. So what next? How can you all um, get involved? Um, please, again, I will send out these resources afterwards, but visit our website for all opportunities on, on ways to get involved in refugee resettlement. Um, I've seen some questions come through the, through the chat about the community sponsorship programs uh, that we have here at, at Churchfold Services, including um, Elizabeth, who had mentioned that she was working um, through, a, through a program with Samaritan's Purse. Um, that is under Churchfold Service, so I'm so glad to see you, Elizabeth, that you are in there. Um, we are working with a, a sponsorship program where individual groups can essentially assume all of the responsibilities that a local affiliate does in welcoming one family or, or however many individuals you have the capacity for. Um, take a look at our website for more information, but essentially you are the caseworker, you are the affiliate, you become an a, an affiliate of Church World Service, and that you will welcome one family to your community wherever you are at. This was built um, in order to help meet the need of the Afghan clients that we saw, although we expect this program to continue far after the, um, all Afghans have been placed. Um, and what I can say is that this program is, is very um, exhaustive and intensive, and in that you are doing all core services that are required for refugee resettlement. 
you're also receiving all the funding, which I'll speak on in a second. I saw a question about that as well. But you are you will you will receive all the funding, provide all the services, find a Daria Pashto interpreter, and work with a family as an affiliate would. So if you're interested in that space, if there's no office nearby you, but you feel that you have the, the means um, to engage in this place, in this space, do check out our website. We have a great team that I work alongside that I'd be happy to refer you to as well for more um, for more information that can help you with this process. You will also see our co-sponsorship manual in the follow-up. This co-sponsorship manual is a fantastic resource in learning more about what co-sponsorship actually looks like in practice. It'll walk you through some of the best practices, such as um, maybe you have a team of 12. How do you um, divide responsibilities across that team of 12? Which teams do you need within your own team? Do you need a transportation team? Do you need um, maybe an, an English language and employment team? Do you need someone who's in charge of all of this, right? It'll walk you through what that looks like in practice, um, what each week looks like in the in the 12 week period um, of resettlement. So do take a look at that if you're interested in engaging in this space. Um, it's, a, it's a very valuable resource. And then finally, you will also see our affiliate network in the follow-up. Um, in this link, it'll link you to all of our offices and our affiliate network, as well as their contact information. So who is the community engagement representative in, um, in each of our offices in Lincoln, Nebraska, in Sacramento, in Oregon. That way you can see, um, that way you can connect directly with the local office and hear what, their, hear what their direct needs are. I can share all day long what I think the needs are, but at the end of the day, the local agency will have the most up-to-date um, a list of what those needs are. So do keep an eye out for all these resources. I will be sending them out shortly. Um, a couple of questions did come in through the chat. One was about the funding. So I do wanna speak a little bit about what funding looks like in terms of refugee resettlement. We receive around $1,200 per individual in the case um, to help meet the needs for those first three months. So if we have a case of four, um, th that those funds are spent down pretty quickly by the time you secure an apartment, pay the deposit in the first three months of rent. Um, so for that reason, we're always looking for donors. Um, I'm sure the, the, the local affiliate network is also looking in that space. And then we receive about $1,000 for administrative costs per individual in the family as well. So um, the funding is not is not robust. If we get very large family sizes, that funding can be stretched a little bit further. Otherwise, it, it, is, it is limited. Now, it is for that reason that we turn to community members and leaders like yourselves to help us um, help us navigate and manage some of the other expenses um, that maybe we can save their, their, their actual funding more for the family. Things like furnishings for the apartment. If we can furnish the entire apartment with, um, with items that community members have, we can save some of those funds for other purposes in the resettlement period. It, you will be shocked how easy it is to furnish a home um, for, for a refugee. The second that you turn to your congregation and say, who has a used couch, you will be shocked how many people have used couches they're ready to get rid of. Um, so this, this work is a lot more doable than maybe it seems. Please take a look at our co-sponsorship um, at the manual, and that'll really help, help to illustrate what this looks like in practice. Um, there, I see a question about what are the distance requirements for an approved refugee resettlement office. At one point, this is uh, in the olden days, two years ago, um, you, to resettle a refugee, that refugee would have to be within 50 miles of the office. That has since um, uh, been taken away. The, the radius is far larger, especially given the fact that we can now resettle refugees to community groups and community sponsors who are doing so almost entirely separately of a local office, they're just directing um, or they are working directly with us at CWS. So um, there are many options in this space. If you are interested in welcoming a family, there is an avenue for you. There is a way to get involved and it is invaluable work. Um, I, I always say so many congregations will go abroad to do a service project or a missions project. That project is in your backyard. It is right there. No one, um, a, a good friend of mine who worked abroad with refugees once said, um, being a refugee is a lack of choice you have lost all of your opportunities to choose. These people need help. They need us, they need community. So that's what you all are here for. Um, I will stop there uh, for today. I will pass it back off to Charity to close us out. But I sincerely thank you for the time um, that you've given me to speak today. I will send out these slides as well as these documents and resources um, for you to touch base on. Um, and I sincerely hope that you get involved in this space and, and with this work. It is incredibly important. It's becoming more important each and every day. Um, and we couldn't do it without all the help of you all um, in the community. So thank you all for the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Ted. Um, 
I hope at the end of this time, you, you see the scope and the need uh, for communities to be involved in welcoming refugees. Um, and, you know, I can tell from, from personal experience as well, I worked in a refugee resettlement agency for 10 years. We cannot do it without the community support. It is refugee resettlement in and of itself is a miracle. Um, just the refugees being able to navigate the very complicated uh, process to come to the United States. So um, it is an, a wonderful opportunity for, for any church and congregation and community of believers to share the love of Christ through this tangible uh, ministry. I just wanted to share my screen one more time um, just to kind of remind you guys of some next steps. Um, so I always believe strongly in the power of prayer. So I think next step should definitely be praying together. Um, I noticed that there were kind of clusters of people attending this webinar from Kansas and Indiana, um, even Northern Virginia. Come together, pray together, see uh, what, what makes sense in your context. Um, is there a resettlement agency nearby or do you have the capacity to consider um, becoming a part of a community partner program uh, like with the Afghan Placement and Assistance Program? Um, consider things, uh, and, and prayer will help you discern that. Uh, you can connect with me at MCC to get linked up with an organization, um, as well as, of course, as TED, uh, Blessing from Church World Service. We uh, do have resources and training that are available for communities every step of the way. Um, and, you know, Church World Service and all the other resettlement agencies are, are really, you know, experts. They have been doing this for decades. Um, so we, of course, uh, lean on them to provide guidance um, and just are so grateful for their service because <laughs> it is truly a, a labor of love. Um, but it is a labor. <laughs> so join us for our next webinar as well. Um, because when we think about uh, refugees, asylum seekers, migrants from many different backgrounds, uh, one of the things we wanted to talk about was how to welcome newcomers um, while addressing trauma um, and migration awareness. So we'll be having our next webinar on May 10th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, and we are really looking forward uh, to having you join us, especially if you are um, going to be engaging with welcoming refugees or asylum seekers um, so again, this is my email, welcome at mcc.org. If you are a community or a congregation that is interested in welcoming refugee families or you are already engaged, I'd love to connect with you um, to, to hear how things are going and also to be able to connect you with other, other folks um, who are also welcoming families. So thank you so much for coming today. And I'm so glad we, we just made it right at 2.59, so we did a really good job. Thank you, Ted. Um, and we will, if you guys have more questions, feel free to email me and I will try to get the answers to, the, to your questions. It's welcome at mcc.org. Have a wonderful uh, day. <laughs>